everyone. My name is Alex Spoto. I'm the program director here at the Tenderloin Museum. How many of you been to the Tenderloin Museum before? Two, three, wonderful. So some new faces. That's what I like to see at our public programs, which happen uh, pretty much every week, typically at this time on Thursdays around 5, 5.30. Uh, this month, we are honored to be co-presenting several programs with Labor Fest. Uh, and uh, for the remainder of the month, this Saturday, we actually have a special walking tour and talk about a uh, very Tenderloin-specific topic. Uh, waitresses, saleswomen from 1910 to 41, as uh, those uh, people were entering into service jobs for the first time in the city. Uh, you know, men off to war, the women kind of filling the roles, and then being like, hey, we're getting paid a lot less. Let's join a union and uh, advocate for higher wages. And uh, yeah, Linda Day will be presenting on that at 3 o'clock this Saturday. It's free. You're all welcome to return. We'd love to have you. And then uh, this time next Thursday, uh, we have one final Labor Fest program here at the museum, which uh, are the Revolutionary Poets. Uh, Bill Shields will be in the house too, I believe, that day. Um, but uh, we always have a uh, have some space to discuss uh, labor and organizing and worker class culture here at the museum. Uh, it is very much a central part to the Tenderloins narrative as a neighborhood, as a community. Uh, besides the vice which earned the neighborhood its uh, suggestive name, uh, this is one of the densest residential neighborhoods in the city. And uh, this building, like many of the buildings in the neighborhood, uh, were, was built after the 1906 earthquake and fire as kind of like workforce housing, residential hotels, a type of uh, accommodation that uh, is rare and rarer these days, but were really central to big American cities in the early part of the 20th century, late part of the 19th century. And, uh, you know, within that, uh, uh, within that world, you had a lot of people from different places mingling, mixing, and a lot of these people were, you know, single working people coming to town to make their careers, and many of them, uh, you know, were, were uh, union members and joined, uh, joined the locals, several of which were uh, based here in the neighborhood. Uh, so, um, we currently have a special exhibit up which are these banners to my right and the slideshow uh, behind this pillar, which none of you can see right now, but it is a, an exhibit that we made with uh, San Francisco State's Labor Archives uh, to tell a little deeper story about the California Labor School. It's always been part of our permanent exhibit here uh, in, that, in that corner over to my left, your right. Uh, but we wanted to tell a little more nuanced story, get a little more detail out there, and specifically we're quite inspired by all of the great photo documentation of the Labor School. Uh, which Lark recently had digitized, and were kind of the basis for uh, making this, you know, more extended narrative. And in the spirit of the California Labor School, which let me back up, how many are familiar with the California Labor School? Many. Uh, it was a union-funded uh, worker school that ran from '42 to '57. Uh, and actually, Local 10 was one of, one of the main funders. Uh, Cleophis Williams writes in the book that uh, I believe Local 10 members were compelled to go to some labor school classes. Uh, and labor schools taught nuts and bolts and organizing and skip, trade skills and stuff like that. But what made it, uh, I think, especially remarkable was their commitment to educating the whole, per the whole person. Uh, so offering quite robust, wide-ranging arts programs, language programs. There were theater classes, you know, photography classes, a graphic design workshop. Uh, and, and many of these, uh, you know, nearly two decades of, of arts education in a kind of working class setting really informed some of the, uh, you know, groups, organizations, formal and less formal, that are still alive and thriving today in the Bay Area, in which, you know, I would expect probably uh, several of you in this room have uh, encountered or participate in currently. So, uh, really exciting uh, to uh, you know take a, a, a closer look at the labor school, but also use it as a jumping off point for programming here at the museum. Uh, as you maybe can tell from hanging out in our front room, we also have a small art gallery space. 
Uh, this neighborhood, because it was such a dense residential neighborhood, there was lots of fun stuff to do for the people that lived here. So there's kind of a pretty long and deep tradition of, of entertainment and culture and arts uh, that are kind of baked into this neighborhood and something we celebrate. And I think when we're able to you know, tell the history of the place uh, through, uh, through the arts, uh, that's you know, particularly powerful and often quite participatory, which is a fun thing. So um, if you like what you see, follow us on social media, sign up for our email newsletter uh, up at the front desk, become a member, uh, and uh, come back uh, for other programming, whether it has to do with labor stuff or not. Is there a question? Question. Yeah. So the stuff that's on the wall is, is more or less permanent. Uh, the front gallery space rotates every two to three months. Um, sometimes it's more straight up arts kind of stuff, and then other times we kind of mix. Uh, you know, we've done programs or, or uh, gallery shows that maybe incorporate like oral histories or video interviews or you know uh, some sort of like archive of a working group here that maybe has an exciting visual element that we present as more like an art you know exhibit. Grace, there's another question though. Yes. So where does all this stuff come from and how extensive an archive do you have of this kind of material for future Good question, big question. I'll try to answer it uh, succinctly. We're not a collecting organization, technically. Uh, we are more of a presenting organization. Uh, the stuff all comes from different places, but I'd say the primary sources are the History Center at the SF Library, uh, two or three private collectors of ephemera, of like restaurants, bars, uh, theaters, that kind of stuff. Um, and then in the case of like the labor school, you know, that's all coming from state, you know, uh, labor archives at SF State. Uh, so, um, yeah, our museum is, uh, like the permanent exhibit is, yeah, relatively fixed, uh, but like I say, I think where we bring people back is through the programming, which happens. You came back, you were here last week, so it worked on you. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yes, the sky's the limit. I mean, uh, yeah, there are <laughs> many, many different archives, uh, and it depends what you're looking for. You know, I think typically each of these archives tend to specialize. Uh, I do like to give a lot of kudos to the to the library. SF San Francisco Public Library is is the archive of the city, so uh, their history center. Uh, at the main branch and Civic Center is like a you know an invaluable resource uh, and there's a lot of that stuff available online as well uh, I know that all of the labor uh, school photos there's 483 of them that have been digitized and uploaded to a state website called California Revealed uh, which hosts photography archives video archives stuff like that uh, and it's accessible you know to anybody uh, but, you know with a computer so um, so yeah, I, uh, I'm going to invite Steve Zeltzer up. Steve uh, organizes Labor Fest and has organized uh, many of these events here at the museum this month. And uh, you want to say a few words about Labor Fest and what's to come? Thank you, uh, Alex and the museum. And I would have to say that this museum actually is a labor history museum, uh, which is good because San Francisco, as a matter of fact, has a great deal of labor history and, and tremendous labor history and there's no real labor museum in San Francisco other than this, this, uh, this museum. So I want to thank the Tenderloin Library for hosting this and co-hosting uh, the talks that we're having here. And we have covered Labor Fest. This is the 30th anniversary of Labor Fest. And we started because we wanted to commemorate the San Francisco General Strike because very few people know about it. And we thought we should institutionalize it so that people would know about the general strike and the effect that it had. And it had a, a, an important effect on all workers in the Bay Area. Hundreds of thousands of workers joined unions as a result of the general strike. And of course, uh, the labor school was a product of the working class up upheaval uh, in San Francisco because thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of workers came uh, to San Francisco from throughout the country, including the South, black workers who came from the South, to San Francisco because they could get jobs, union jobs. And there was a fight, of course, against segregation. And we have the Marine Cooks and Stewards, which was one of the unions in San Francisco that actually fought segregation. Uh, and the way they fought it is not by lawsuits 
and not by protest. They fought it by saying to the owners of the ships, you are not going to sail unless the ship's integrated. So they used labor power to force integration and fight racism. And that's lessons for today in the struggle against racism, which still exists uh, in the labor movement with hanging noose incidents and that kind of thing. So uh, Clarence is a important figure uh, in the ILWU and fighting to continue the struggle of the ILWU, historic struggle in the ILWU against racism, uh, against the attack on blacks, uh, police terrorism, and also for internationalism uh, with workers around the world. And this history uh, needs to be uh, recognized and supported because um, working people in this country are hungry for a labor movement that actually fights, not just here, but internationally with workers around the world. And the ILWU, of course, was an institution, a workers' institution, that saw its task not just for workers in the union, but for supporting solidarity of workers around the world, which is very important. And that's why there was a fight uh, against the apartheid regime in South Africa and others, uh, against dictatorships in Korea and other places. So uh, Clarence has taken it upon himself with his wife, Dolores, who's also here. And <laughs> to get the history, the hidden history, of the ILWU out and, and some of the activists and leaders. And I would urge people to get their books because the history that they brought forward in their books is uh, really important for working people uh, to know where you come from. If you don't know where you come from, you're not, you're not gonna know where you're going. And that is critical in this world because uh, we face a cataclysm, we face AI. There was a program here on AI which is a threat to all working people uh, around the world. And we have to know our history and the fight of labor. So without further ado, welcome Clarence. Oh, before I do uh, start, I wanted to let people know there are a number of other events. We have flyers here. And um, we're going to be having a, uh, uh, an a, a exhibit uh, on the 1973 uh, struggle against apartheid in Durban, South Africa, where there was a rebellion against the apartheid regime in 1973. David Hempson is coming. Uh, to set it up, and we saw that in uh, Durban, South Africa. Um, also, we're going to be having a panel on AI, on how it's affecting workers. Uh, Goldman Sachs, by the way, says 350 million workers may lose their jobs as a result of AI. When you talk 350 million, that is an uh, existential crisis for labor, and that's what the writers have been saying. This is an exodus, existential crisis. And also, we have our boat trip on the 30th, uh, and hopefully we'll have our uh, Clarence and his wife and the books there. And we have labor historians, uh, Gray Breck and others, uh, talking about labor history. Uh, to, so we, we have a beautiful bay to have a boat ride and learn about that history. So thank you. And without further ado, Clarence. Solidarity greetings, all. Wonderful to be with you this evening. Uh, this occasion has been made possible by Sister Sadie Williams, who is the wife and widow of Cleophas uh, Williams, whose book we were given permission to publish. This is manuscript that he wrote. He was a, a writer. He was a uh, parliamentarian. He was a labor leader, a strategic thinker. He was a working class intellectual what he was from the, the deep south where he faced the multifaceted structures of white supremacy and segregation and apartheid in the United States of America. Um, let me first of all say that uh, I want to again introduce my wife uh, and my partner Dolores Lemon Thomas. Dolores <laughs> Dolores edited this book. Uh, she's also the co-founder of Declara Publishing, and it doesn't take very much imagination to figure out that the D stands for Dolores and the Clara stands for Clarence. Um, I'm a third generation longshore worker. Uh, my grandfather started working on the waterfront in 1944, the same year that Cleophas Williams came on the waterfront. Uh, he came to Oakland, California in 1942, the same year that Cleopas Williams 
came to Oakland. His first job was at Moore Shipyard, where Cleophas also <laughs> started working. And so Cleophas knew my grandfather. And um, it's, this meant a lot to me to have this opportunity to do this. But let me get back to Sister Sadie Williams for a minute. She will celebrate her 100th birthday next February 25th. And she already has the hall reserved <laughs> for that day. And she couldn't be with us tonight, but she's here in spirit. Um, my mother is here tonight. Uh, Mrs. Charlene Thomas, she's 94 years young, and uh, I, 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 I tease her because I tell her she's been the daughter of a longshore worker, she's been the wife of a longshore worker, the mother of a longshore worker. She's been on the payroll of the employer since 1944. She grew up in a longshore family. And that's part of the reason why she's still alive at 94 years of age. No doubt about it in my mind. Um, just to talk a little bit about the, the California Labor School, I, I, I wasn't familiar with that until I started talking to Cleophas, to be quite honest about it. I, I may have heard bits and pieces of it. But Cleophas speaks of, it was a requirement if you wanted to get your union book, you had to attend the California Labor School and you had to be a registered voter. Yeah. Um, to quote from Cleopas, I'm gonna go back more specifics with the California Labor School, but I just wanted to say this. Quote from Cleopas, I attended union meetings more often than required and enrolled at the California Labor School. Local 10 made it a requirement that men attend the California Labor School and show proof that they were registered voters before they could receive their books to join the union. Very powerful. If you were attending the California Labor School, you might have encountered Sister Maya Angelou, you may have attended a, um, a lecture by Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. You may have uh, taken a, uh, a physics class by Frank Oppenheimer, the brother of J. Robert Oppenheimer, who, create, who, discuss, who created the Exploratorium here in San Francisco. This was a radical training school. And that has special meaning for me because my radical training school was San Francisco State starting in 1967. That was my radical training school. That's where I was introduced to the whole concept of revolutionary struggle. Introduced to books by men like Dr. Franz Fanon, introduced to Kwame Nkrumah, Che Guevara, and so many other revolutionary figures. And so I understand the importance of training, and especially being a young person introduced to revolutionary ideas and concepts, and then being able to implement them. Because long before I really had a vivid understanding about the 1934 strike. I was part of the leadership of the San Francisco State Strike, which was waged for four and a half months. Steve Zeltzer was a part of that struggle. The iconic actor and activist, Danny Glover, was also a part of that, and so many, many more. Roger Alvarado, a number of people who are still alive today, Benny Stewart, George Murray, this, the, uh, the uh, uh, Minister of Education for the Black Panther Party. Those were very meaningful years because I learned firsthand that if there is a will to win, 
and a commitment to revolutionary struggle, change could be made in America. And we did that, and the testament is the San Francisco State Black Studies Department and the School of Ethnic Studies that stands today. Um, I didn't write this book. Um, Cleophas trust, trusted me with this manuscript that he had written. It was 92 pages. So I guess he thought that there was something in me that merited me having that document. And he told me, he says, now, I don't want you to share this with anyone. And I didn't. But I did make a copy of it. <laughs> Not even my wife saw it. Um, before I get started, let, let me just, because I don't want to hog the mic too much. Uh, Sister Dolores, would you come up please and at least um, read your message from the editor regarding Cleophas and what your editing this book has meant to you and so many of those who are in the audience tonight? This is Sister Dolores Lemon Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he thinks I'm going to do, but I've already changed my mind. I'm doing something else. Oh, very good. So have a seat. All right. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> I'm Dolores, and um, worked with Clarence on, on the book. Cleophas wrote his own book, like Clarence just said. He had manuscripts. And I talked to Sadie today when I did speak to her. She was explaining to me that Cleophas wrote every day about things that was going on in his life and what he did. When Clarence and I went to talk to her based on his writing, and in the book you can actually see his penmanship and follow along different parts of his life. He starts with uh, his birth back uh, in Arkansas. Was it? I can't even remember that. Uh, but anyway, when he was <laughs> three years old and he goes all the way up. But he had a story to tell. And I learned a lot about my family background from reading his story. Mm -hmm. There were things that he was talking about that I didn't know from my own background. My father uh, grew up and was raised in New Orleans. He had a fight with uh, a white guy on the job Saturday night. They, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, the Knight Riders came to his mother's house looking for him. The family pitched pennies together, put him on a train, sent him out here. When he came to the Bay Area, he worked at some of the same locations that Cleo Cleophas worked at. He was also in the service and he talks about, Cleophas does, what happened to him when he was in the military. My father never explained to me or our siblings his time in the military. He never told us about how he came here, why the fear for his death, for the racism and the Jim Crow and the Ku Klux Klan that he experienced in New Orleans. And to me, the book opened my eyes to my own family but also people that I'm sharing with, my girlfriend, my little sis Deb is here, find out from her talking about Cleophas' book that similar something happened to her father. What I've learned from this is that everybody has a story. We tell our stories in different ways and we have different things about our life that we want to talk about. You're going to be just a little part of this with me. I want to give you 10 seconds, everybody in the room, 10 seconds. Close your eyes, open them, stand up, or whatever. If you had to tell one part of your life, one part of your story, one anything that you would like to leave behind about you, what would that be? Now think. One, one second, two seconds. You're supposed to be thinking. That's right, Steve. Close your eyes. What would you tell? Kathy, my sister-in-law, Clarence's sister, what would you want to put? I would like to tell how my father taught us girls how to make 
basically bad for ourselves to not depend on a male to come and fix your car, change the oil, do your tires. Before we drove any automobile of his, we had to know how to change the oil, change the tires, all of that. Sir, thank you, Kathy. You, what would you? Uh, I didn't have my hand up, but. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, reading Theophilus' history brought to mind the one thing I shared in common with him from birth is that I was born in Georgia during World War II because my father, who was from Pennsylvania, was transferred down to Brunswick, Georgia. And if you're familiar with Georgia and specifically Brunswick, that's where Ahmed Arbery was murdered just a couple years ago. And it hasn't changed much because what I remember, what brought to the fore in my brain was I was born down there and my mother's family had just fled the fascists, the Nazis, in Germany and reached the United States in 1938. And I was the firstborn and they came down south to see the firstborn. And the house was filled with the neighbors there, all white, of course because the South was segregated, even in the military. And the neighbors were really curious to see her firstborn. So my grandmother said to my mother, wow, she said, isn't this wonderful? Of course, she had a, they were speaking in German. She said, isn't this one wunderbar that all the neighbors are here to celebrate the birth of Jack? And my mother said, mom, they're not here to celebrate they're here to see a Jew baby with horns and a tail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, would anybody else, <laughs> sir? Oh, and, and I learned from that to fight racism. And I went back to Atlanta, Georgia, worked with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and that's what radicalized me, just as San Francisco State radicalized uh, Good. Could you, could you say who Jack is? So no, he can tell him, introduce yourself. Introduce yourself, Jack. Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, I came into the uh, local 10 about the same time Clarence did. Uh, my, before I was in local 10, I was in the learning division of the ILW, which is the Boltons Union, in the Boltons Union. And Leo Robinson and Howard Kaler worked together. Leo was uh, one of the leading black trade unionists in, in the ILWU. And together they came up with an action to hit the first ship that comes in from South Africa in 1984. And the union voted to strike against that ship. I was proud to be a part of the ILWU. I just moved out from New York. That was my first action, to, to work with Local 10 to strike against the ship from South Africa. And since then, I'm not going to go through my whole history. But, uh, that was my first introduction to activism in the ILWU. Thank you. Uh, mine was when I met a woman named Linda Gudina, and a Roma woman from Ethiopia, and got to know her and ended up going to work in Ethiopia. Thank you. So I. I I couldn't put Cleophas' uh, written manuscripts down. I would go and read 10 pages, and they're handwritten, most of them, and you'll see in the book that we put it, you know, some pages, his handwritten pages in the book. But I would have to go back and read some more because it was so interesting, and what I found out that everybody has a story. And because you have a story, you, can, you need to write it down, you need to share it, and this is uh, a book that I absolutely love. Uh, editing it, you know, working with Clarence, <laughs> sometimes was a problem. But others liked it too. So, for instance, I would like to give everybody a book review. If you haven't picked it up, we do have book reviews that came from the, um, the International Longshore, um, Harvey Schwartz, who's a curator for the International, uh, a little bit from Sadie, 
and then a personal friend of ours. Three different people, three different positions, and what they're saying about the book and how it's touched them and the information that's there. Sorry, Mr. Thomas, I know I'm off script, but I just thought that sometimes you need to read personal stories, work stories, other stories from other people to appreciate the fact that you have a story. And the thing about this book, no matter who you are in this room, your voice is in here. The way Cleophas wrote this book, what he said from birth, working in ILWU, going to church, uh, starting the first uh, African American golf association here, working with the NAACP, coming to, um, to the school, all of it is here, and somewhere in this book, you're in it, in your own mind, on your own page, and then sit down like he did, and every other day, or once a week, write your story so others can read and appreciate who you are. Thank you. Thank you. story and on the end of my page, thank you Mr. Thomas, I said the book is a compilation of Cleophas Williams writings selected by Clarence Thomas, edited by Dolores in consultation with Sadie Williams. Every effort has been made to stay true to the original manuscript. So if the word is misspelled, if the period is in the wrong place, if the semicolon ain't right, and if the title of the job Cleophas wrote it and I typed it. Wow. Um, just to put some things in context. Um, African Americans started working on the waterfront in, in an organized faction. 1864, some of the earliest longshore workers were workers that were in um, Charleston, South Carolina, as a matter of fact. And one of the interesting things about their story is African Americans, Africans, enslaved Africans, could go into the swamps that was one of the ways they could escape from the slave master because their makeup, to a certain degree, immune them from malaria. And in terms of their working as long show workers, because they were working near the water and because of the fact that the overseers were reluctant to be where they were, they were able to organize and work independently in gangs, setting the tone for how future longshore workers would work. And I found that to be quite remarkable. But African Americans have been a very integral part, I'm quoting now for my introduction, of building the world-renowned legacy of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU. Such an individual is Cleophas Williams, whose distinguished career as a member of that union spanned 38 years. Solidarity Stories, an oral history of the ILWU by Harvey Schwartz, includes an interview with Cleophas. Cleophas Williams' election as president of ILWU Local 10 in 1967 made him the highest ranking African American to serve as an officer in the entire ILWU. This was the same year that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke at Local 10 and was made an honorary member. 
This achievement made Cleophas, the quote, Jackie Robinson of the world-renowned ILWU. And with that being said, that would make his wife, Sadie, the Rachel Robinson. Sadie is a very vigorous woman. As I mentioned before, approaching her 100th birthday. She's, an act, she's a member of the executive board of the San Francisco Bay Area ILW Pensioners Club and a member of the Pacific Coast Pensioners Association, ILWU. She and her daughter, Jackie Shahan, were very cooperative and supportive of us being able to do this book. In the spring of 2015, during one of my many, our many visits paid to the Williams home with Dolores and myself, he shared something extraordinary with me. It was a 92-page handwritten manuscript in his impeccable penmanship. He implored me not to share this extraordinary document that describes his life on the waterfront, including his first day on the job. I honored his request. However, I must confess, I did surreptitiously keep a copy and placed it amongst my most private archives. Reflecting on that decision, it was a very wise choice. When we approached Sister Sadie with the idea of publishing a manuscript that Cleopas had written about his life on the waterfront, she said that she had never seen it. And when we shared it with her, she took it and held it close to her heart because she didn't know it existed until then. Sister Sadie was overjoyed. Having read our first book, Mobilizing in Our Own Name, Million Worker March, which she reminded us she keeps at her bedside, she conveyed her confidence in our publishing this important work. When I suggested that she allow us to make a copy of the manuscript, she responded that she would make it herself. <laughs> we got a sense that Sister Sadie did not want to relinquish control of the document just yet. I immediately concluded that I would end the discussion for the moment and leave it to Dolores to broach the subject after lunch. <laughs> this proved to be a most sensible way to approach the situation. After a wonderful lunch, Sadie allowed us to have access to some other manuscripts. When Dolores suggested that it would be easier for us to make copies and return them to her, she agreed. She said she had many more personal writings and travel diaries and archival materials that she felt would be helpful in doing this book. As I mentioned earlier, Cleophas possessed elegant penmanship. His parents were college educated and both were, ed were teachers. He was salu salutatorian of his high school class and attended Arkansas Agricultural Mechanical and Normal College, Arkansas AMNN, in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Williams was born in rural Camden, Camden Arkansas, was part of more than the 100,000 Negroes to migrate to the Bay Area during and after World War II. He arrived in Oakland, California in 1942, seeking to escape the horrors and multifaceted structures of systemic racism and white supremacy. Cleopas and I spent many hours discussing the early years of ILWU Local 10, and specifically Brother Leo Robinson, a legendary rank and file leader. Robinson described Cleophas as a, quote, a working class intellectual, strategic thinker, a mentor, and one of the leading parliamentarians in the history of the ILW Local 10. He was a man of courage and conviction. Yet, that being said, he was a very humble person. Cleophas' first job was at Moore Dry Dock Company, a ship repair and, and uh, shipbuilding facility in Oakland. There's an iconic photo of Paul Robeson singing for workers in, at that shipyard in 1942, the same year Williams was hired. He was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1943. Uh, Alex, could we show some photographs? These are some graphics that are from the book. 
John Henry Williams and Bertha Williams. Aren't they a distinguished looking couple there? I found that so remarkable. They say that uh, the most photo one of the most photographed men in America was Frederick Douglass. And there's something about Frederick Douglass that is so remarkable is that he looked so dignified, didn't he? He looked like a guy who didn't take any SHIT. <laughs> Fearless. This is Cleophas' mother and father. His father had a hunting accident and lost part of his left arm. His, his mother went to Tuskegee. See his sister Alma, Marie, Lucille, and then he's with uh, Ardella, his uh, stepmom. We can show another one, uh, Alex, thank you. This look that this could be one of my nephews. <laughs> look at this guy. He's a salutatorian of his class, graduated number two. This is his commencement exercise program. His father laid a strong foundation for learning, as one can imagine. And this, this, that's his photograph of, from being in the service. We'll go on to the next one. None of my English teachers had penmanship this good when, they were, when I was in school. This man's penmanship, incredible. He was the kind of a fellow that could take notes like a meeting like this, and then at the end of the meeting, give you the finished notes. No need for editing. When I was secretary treasurer of Local 10, I took copious notes, but it took the secretaries about three days <laughs> to decipher. <laughs> this man, look at this. That's the, the iconic photograph of Paul singing at Moore's shipyard. And I never did ask Cleophas if he were amongst those individuals there. But that's an iconic photograph. But he was working there in 1942. This is some of the, this is how the waterfront looked in the early days before containerization. Crates, a winch, four crane. They still had winches, Jack, when you came down, right? They had winch. I sell Did you operate them? Yeah. yeah, okay. We can go on, Alex, to the next one. This, Cleopas was a Renaissance man. He was a golfer. He, he caddied when he was a youngster to make extra money. He started an organization, one of the founders of an organization called Western States Golf. One of their objectives were, was to desegregate public golf courses in the Bay Area. This was a guy who took what he learned from the ILWU and put it in practice outside of the union. This is the 56 Club. And uh, these men here are what you would call some of the forward thinking guys on the waterfront. Uh, these were men who, some were educated, had been to college, some had been introduced to union, uh, to, to longshore work in the Gulf states. So when they came to the Bay Area, they knew what a union was, and they also had skills to operate the equipment on the waterfront. That man on the far right is my father. Yeah, he, that was my dad and uh, yeah, he was, and he was a fighter, too. Thank you, Alex, we'll go on to the next one. Okay, this is an iconic photo here. 
of a, a black longshore worker during the 1934 strike being arrested. Uh, there weren't a lot of black people living in the Bay Area in 1934. And even fewer working on the waterfront. They were some. And those that were working on the waterfront, they got there by being scabs. And they were very productive and the employer kept them on. Yeah, that's, that was the reality of how things were in those days. Uh, and it was people like Bridges and Henry Schmidt, who was a member of the party, uh, other leftists in the IL, we weren't the ILW, we were the ILA then, who realized that the strike in 1934 could not be won with African, African Americans crossing that picket line. The recognition of the relationship between race and class. These were Marxist Leninists. These were men who understood the contradictions. And it was people like C.L. Dellums, the uncle of Ron Dellums, who was the vice president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, who was very supportive of bridges. This is before the Bay Bridge. So they were going to black churches on, in Oakland and San Francisco, making an appeal. That photograph at the top, this was the photograph I believe that was taken in 1934 after the death of, some call him Nick Bordois, someone said Bordois the other day, and Howard Spirit. They were on Market Street. Well, what followed was four days that shook San Francisco, it was completely paralyzed for four days. That's what that photograph. The other photograph shows men who were, who were on the picket, who were striking in Seattle in 1946. You can go on. Ah, this group right here. Well, that's a group, isn't it? Johnny Walker, Albert James, Harry Bridges, who, uh, what is his name? Uh, 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 Goldblatt, I believe on the right. Uh, uh, William Bill Chester, and I forget the other uh, uh, white brother, and the great Harry Bridges. This was the Harry Bridges Defense Committee. Can you imagine if you were a black man Coming from the deep south, maybe you worked on the cotton fields or were a sharecropper or some other type of job where there was no union. You come to San Francisco and join the most democratic and radical union in the United States of America where an Australian <laughs> says that if there's only two jobs left on the waterfront, one should be black and one should be white. Do you know how, what black men thought about that? How they respected this guy? And can you also imagine some of the resentment of the ILWU brothers who were not progressive and who thought that Bridges was too close to the blacks. That's a historic photograph. This, this is a group of longshoremen in the 40s uh, in, the, in the hall, not at the hall on um, uh, uh, North Point, but the hall that they had before they moved to North Point. I think when you do your tours, Jack, walking tours, you, you just, was it on Drum Street? Oh. Okay. And the other is Goldblatt on the left, Bridges, and William Bill Chester. 
William Bill Chester would have been the Jackie Robinson of the ILWU, but the issue of his race did not allow him to be elected to, you know, to a position of power and authority. Bridges had to appoint him to a position. Northern, North, the Northern Area Director? Yeah. He was very well qualified. A brilliant man. Who, by the way, was part of the group to negotiate the strike at San Francisco State in 1968. Yes, he was. Oh, okay, uh, Alex. This is Harry Bridges and a young Cleophus Williams. And that photograph there is, captures something that was much too common on the waterfront, a longshore brother who was injured. Uh, waterfront's a very dangerous place. It still is, and back then it was even more dangerous. Longshoremen, then and today, pay for their jobs with their lives. If anything should hit you on that waterfront, it's going to maim you or kill you. Okay, and that's our logo. Thank you. This is another meeting with Cleophus and other members of the ILWU. Cleophus was a dignified guy. He wore suits and ties. And his cat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can't, you know, he was not bourgeois, but this is how he presented himself. Okay, go ahead. This is, this is his campaign literature. Those hats are back in style now. Yeah. And when you read his record, available to the membership, day and night, this fact, cut costs, cut, uh, cut the, uh, the cost of operating the union. And just, he's laying out all of the things that he has accomplished. So he wasn't a guy who was just glad handing and oh yeah, yeah, vote for me, you know, and handing out, no, he said, this is what, I'm, this is what I've done. This is what I stand for. Okay, Alex, thank you. Ah, this is Sister Sadie Williams. This is an article from the Oakland Post newspaper, which is a black newspaper. And they describe his victory in 1967. They said it was a breakthrough in labor minority relations. You didn't see African Americans getting elected to office. At the time that he was elected to president of Local 10, Local 10 was the biggest local on the West Coast. We had containerization first to Port of Oakland. And eventually, LA Long Beach overtook us. But there were nearly 5,000 members in the ILWU Local 10 at that time. They used to have two union meetings a month. Yeah. And this is Cleophus speaking. Three-piece suit. Yeah. Yeah, he's a... And Sister Sadie, she's... You, you're talking about someone who understood politics? She comes from a family that have made their living on the waterfront starting with her family. They owned a restaurant in Houston, right on the waterfront where the, where the workers could eat. And she was married to a, another longshore worker before he passed away. Okay, thank you, Alex. Ah, Leo Robinson. His father started working on the waterfront in the 1940s, the same time that Cleophas. Uh, did. And uh, Leo used to say, when his father came on the waterfront, he said, next to Jesus Christ was Harry Bridges. You could not say anything bad about Harry Bridges without getting a knuckle sandwich. And we have to understand why. Long before there was affirmative action, that action on the part of the 
Longshore workers in San Francisco was revolutionary. That's how we got the hiring hall and everything else that followed. When we were able to strike a blow against white supremacy, the employers were very angry about this. I can't bring my blacks on to break the strike and continue making money and working? Okay. Oh, go back for a minute. This photograph here. I'm, I'm so glad we're showing these photographs because this Great. breaks up my yeah. talking all the time. But this photograph here, this is Cleopas, one of the first delegations of rank and filers to go to the People's Republic of China. Yeah, there he is. Then to the right is Brother Leo Robinson and Sister Geraldine Johnson, who was the founder of the Northern California chapter of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. All right. And to Leo's left, David Ndaba. He was a member of the ANC who was underground in the United States of America going to medical school here. And Leo and his wife and others supported him. He's a big muggity mug in South Africa right now. I shouldn't say it like that, but he's, he's in a very powerful position. All right, Alex. This is a later photograph of Brother Cleopas. To the right, the lower right corner, Sister Sadie. Angela Davis and Cleophas. And another photograph of those two. They were partners. She was another strategic thinker. She did some incredible things, which we'll talk about later. Thank you, Alex. We can go on. And this is memorabilia from Cleophas' archives. He was a lifelong member of the NAACP. He used to get up every morning at 5 o'clock and swim. Oh, I got you. She said, cut it off. So we can cut it off, Alex. Oh, wait, wait, wait hold on, one other thing. This is at his dedication. <laughs> this is, this is a, a garden with a boulder that was dedicated to Cleophas a couple of years ago. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, how much time do we have left? Okay. All right. Let, let, me, let, me, let me just say one thing that I found so remarkable about this book to wrap it up. Cleophas is a very honest fellow. And he talked about contradictions that exist among right wing, left wing, black and white, in a very honest way, which I think you will find refreshing. I wish I had read this book before I was elected president of local, I mean, secretary of treasury of Local 10. It would have been very helpful, because in reading this book, he was dealing with some of the same issues that I was dealing with. Um, I'm gonna allow the people to ask questions right now. I, I wanna thank you for your attention. Um, and um, it's very important that I had this opportunity to speak to you tonight. I hope you do buy the book. Um, this is something that I believe is very important for the next generation to be able to learn from. So if you want to buy the book for someone in your family or for some young person, um, that would be welcome. Um, that's about it. I'll, I'll wrap it up. Anyone have any questions? Y yes? Why did the newspaper clipping say local 110 instead of local 10? He opened the uh, news clipping. Typo. I'm sorry? What about the news clipping? Probably a typo. Uh, when you showed the Oakland Post article, they had local 110. Oh, that was a typo. Yeah, yeah and, 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 and so we didn't change anything. I mean, it's, it was... Was the typo? Right. Yeah, it was local ten, and it, 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 they, they might have wanted to say L ten or something like that, mm -hmm. you know. But very observant on your part. 
Uh, Steve? Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the things about the ILWU, unfortunately unique in most of the labor movement, is they have a democratic tradition of debate and discussion in their union. And for those who haven't been in the ILWU, they have no experience of real debate and struggle in a union meeting. <laughs> but that is part of the tradition of the ILWU, to have debates and discussions. And you know, one of the problems in this country is there are very little mm -hmm. debates and discussions mm -hmm. in the working class. You have a top-down structure, yeah. and things are decided by the officials. There's no debate and discussion. That yeah. is different in the ILWU, and that makes it a qualitatively different union. Whatever the result of it, they actually have a discussion and a debate. And I think as a something we can learn for the rest of the labor movement, mm -hmm. this is why the ILWU is so important. Because it's no accident that the FBI and the capitalists wanted to crush the ILWU. Mm -hmm. It's like they want to crush Cuba. Mm -hmm. Because they don't mm -hmm. want an example of a different kind of system. And it's the true. ILWU was a different kind of human. Very different, qualitatively different. And they still exist, which is a good thing. Because it's an example of where you can have a structure in the working class where you can have democratic debate and discussion. We need that in all of the labor. There is a microphone that is placed right in front of the stage and the podium with chairs on either side. And rank and filers can come up and speak and discuss whatever it is that they want to talk about. Of course, they, it has to be approved by the membership, but that's real democracy. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. What period of time? Nineteen forty six. Nineteen forty six. That's when that, that, that march was taking place. Yeah, there was a revolution going on in China. It was a communist revolution and we were supporting the revolution. Just as we did in Cuba. We supported the Cuban revolution. But what I wanted to say was actually you saw a picture of Paul Robeson up there. Mm -hmm. That was during the war. Paul, Harry Bridges made Paul Robeson an honorary member of the ILWU. And following in that tradition, well, the 60s were a very heavy time. You had the San Francisco State Strike in 68, was it? 68. And 69, Cleopas got elected, the first black president. 67. 67. Mm -hmm. And 1971, Cleophus introduced a resolution at the ILWU convention to make Angela Davis uh, an honorary member of, excuse me, to, uh, to defend Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. And we had the first rally here in San Francisco at the Union Hall, and the resolution said to free Angela Davis. I jumped the gun because we did make her an honorary member. Uh, two years ago. Two years ago was mm -hmm. it? Yeah, so Angela Davis is also an honorary Members could come up and speak. Right, but you said something about the ILWU has to approve something? Oh, the membership. Like, if a member gets up and wants to make a motion or to wants to d discuss an issue that's, that's not necessarily on the agenda, then they can do that. Yeah, that's what democracy is. Um, the, the ILWU Local 10 Union Hall is a place where Workers come when they can't even get heard in their own unions. Mm -hmm. They come to us because they know about our history mm -hmm. and how we operate. Uh, and democracy is not pretty. You have, well, we don't have fist fights anymore, but they, they used to have them doing Cleopas' day. <laughs> you know, strong opinions. And, um, you know, one of the things that I think we, th that is so important that I didn't have a chance really to talk about is the 1950s and the McCarthy era. And um, th the fact that the California Labor School, it started out being the Tom Mooney School first. That was the first name in 42. Then it changed to California Labor School in 44. But the Attorney General of the State of California went after them because they said, this is the Communist Front. 
you know, and they started to challenge their, um, their status as a uh, nonprofit organization. And it shut down in 1957, but it did a lot of wonderful things. And um, it was leftist. I mean, that's what it was. I mean, we, we need to have institutions like that. What shut down in 1957? 1957 is when it was closed. It meaning, oh, the, the laborers. The California Labor School. Mm -hmm. uh, but th th I just wanted to tell you this very quickly. They had this thing called uh, Coast Guard screening in the 50s. And it, what it was, it was a means by which the, the, the federal government could move against people on the waterfront that they didn't want working because of their politics and other reasons. So this is what Cleopas points out. These are some of the questions that they ask. Are you a member of the Communist Party? <laughs> Have you ever been? <laughs> Is your wife a member of the Communist Party? Or has she ever been? Do you subscribe to People's World? Do you have, have uh, do you or have you ever attended the California Labor School? Who were your teachers? If you had, did you ever read the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx? If so, what do you think about it? Were you ever in the company of Paul Robeson? I mean, these are some of the questions. Yeah, I, you know, and, and so, you know, Cleopas says, I had attended the California Labor School. One of my professors was Dr. Robinson, a PhD from Stanford who taught US history and economics. Another instructor was David Jenkins, a founder of the school. He taught the anatomy of politics, political science. Yes. I read the Communist Manifesto. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, yes, and I, and I read Dr. Hewlett Johnson's writing. He was called the leftist dean of Canterbury. Uh, no, I was not and had not ever been a member of the Communist Party. But Cleopas says that one of the things that happened, and this is how this, the system will cause in they, you know, you're not, you're not a real warrior, but just to cause confusion. Because many of the blacks, my own grandfather, he was unable to work at a military installation service centers. And it probably had something to do with some meetings that he attended prior to even coming to the Bay Area. But I just wanted to, to, to mention that. Leo, you know, he, he, he tells quite a bit. Deborah, you had your hand up? Oh, okay. Brother, Brother Cole Thurst. Where are the uh, plans to get this book and your book as well into uh, the public library system? Uh, well, right now you can purchase uh, the book through um, Barnes and Nobles. Is that right, Dolores? Yes. Barnes and Nobles has, you can, you can order the book through Barnes and Nobles. But in terms of in, in terms of what specifically have we donated the book to any schools yet or anything like that? Well, uh, I believe the San Francisco Public Library System has a budget to purchase the book and put it in their inventory so it can be circulating amongst the reading public. Mm -hmm. Can we discuss that after the sure, meeting? Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, uh, because I have other books that have been put in libraries in, in Oakland. One of the things, another important aspect of what happened in the 50s, the witch hunts, is that people were blacklisted, so they could not work. And the Marine Cooks and Stewards, Jimmy Herman, was blacklisted out of the Marine Cooks and Stewards. And as I said when I spoke, the reason they went after the Marine Cooks and Stewards, an important reason, was they were fighting racism. Yes. In the ships. And he was able to work at the RWU and eventually become president of the RWU. But this was a refuge. Yes. This was a refuge for activists, socialists, who were fighting in the working class against racism. And that's very important to understand, that history, uh, because otherwise they would not have been able to work. Let me just say this very quickly. You know, Cleopas said that he had been interviewed many times by writers and scholars for several hours. He said, but this was his opportunity to tell his story the way that it should be told. 
you know, and I think that that's one of the reasons why I felt compelled to do this. This is very, very important. I met a woman a few days ago in line in Arizona buying at Safeway. And I told her that I was about to do a book tour in New York. You know what she said to me? It was a, it was a white a woman. She says, oh, I don't think your book will be sold in the, your book will be, <laughs> will be in Florida in the library. <laughs> I said, you're probably right, it probably won't. But she just understood what's going on in the country. You know, and we had a very interesting conversation. She said, when I, was, when I was a young mother, I took my children to the library for them to read whatever they wanted to read. You know, I mean, haven't we been through this chapter already? Uh, James Joyce's Ulysses was banned. Uh, the author of The Tropic of Cancer. I mean, we, we've been through censorship. We going back to that again? That's the reason why this, these books need to be in the hands of our young people for them to understand.